Here's London today, an absolute smog fest of dirty, choking, cold, burning, apocalyptic... Oh no, sorry, that's the great smog of 1952. Here it is today. Seems alright, doesn't it? But don't be fooled though, in a world with terror around every corner, you can't actually see the most harmful pollution these days, as it's so microscopically small. Yes, I'm still talking about pollution. Go back to the Victorian times and it looked like this. If you had a choice, which London would you rather live in? This one or that one? Perspective is everything. There has always been end time, apocalyptic, cultist protests screaming that the world is ending. And I'm as confused as anybody else as to whether man-made climate change will actually be the death of us all in the near future or not. I, like so many others, certainly don't want it to be. But if it is, that's that then. 13.7 billion years in the making of our species and we blew it, like Monica Lewinsky. Even if you don't think that climate change is about to end the world, it still makes sense to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible because A. We will run out of oil eventually and B. There really is a viable alternative option to power our planet from sustainable resources with wind, solar, nuclear, hydropower, geothermal, ocean energy and even green hydrogen once we've got an abundance of clean electricity that we can use to make it. And as I keep hammering home, battery storage is the missing piece of the sustainable energy jigsaw. Speaking of which, welcome to the Tesla jigsaw. I'm Will, just another confused human trying to figure stuff out. By switching to renewable energy and electric transportation as quickly as we can, the benefits that come with it will be far cleaner air quality, quieter citizen streets, less lung damage, asthma and breathing conditions for our kids, adults and the oldies. Let's not forget them. And of course, if the planet truly does need to quit oil with the urgency we are being told by most of the world's scientists, this might actually be a real bonus for future generations, as we all pop our clogs and perhaps leave behind a planet worth inhabiting. An abundance of sustainable, renewable electricity will mean far lower prices for consumers in the future. Hmm, okay, even I'm sceptical of that one. Theoretically, that should be the case though, because once the infrastructure is there and paid for, it's producing free electricity. It cannot cost as much as the whole fossil fuel single-use diggy uppy burny approach, can it? And renewables are in fact already the cheapest form of energy production. As you can see in this chart, the cost of onshore wind and solar has plummeted over the past 10 years. It's also calculated on the full cost of building the power plant itself, as well as the ongoing costs for fuel and operating the power plant over its lifetime. It's a bit of a no-brainer to see which of those makes sense to power our planet. But if you don't want to rely on others for your energy, you can always set yourself a goal to get solar panels and battery storage for your home someday. And you'll create your own electricity to power everything in your house and charge your electric car for the rest of time. Doesn't that sound appealing? I digress. <laughs> in the present day though, illegal levels of air pollution are affecting the health and quality of life of people across the UK and obviously the rest of the world. The harms from air pollution have been well documented by the scientific community. A recent example, which I'll link below, is a study showing that unborn foetuses have air pollution in their lungs and their brains before they take their first breath. Now that cannot be good for little developing organs, can it? Although, no doubt that's always been the case throughout history, as pregnant mothers all sat around cold burning fireplaces and ovens, and before you knew it, you were four years old and up a chimney, and if you were lucky enough to survive to adulthood, you'll be down the mines digging for coal for the rest of your miserable life. The only respite being a bottle of ludicrous strength alcohol and a packet of fags. Again, in the interest of balance of fairness, do you think things are better now? If not, would you really rather live in the Victorian age where most people died of their teeth in their 40s? Still, working towards even cleaner air for all humans will no doubt have positive effect on people's health and later complications in life. Unless, of course, you eat like a pig, you drink like a horse, you never exercise and you choose to smoke yourself to death. If that's the case, air pollution probably won't be very high on your radar or a contributing factor to your health. Just saying. So let's pick one city, London, to see what positive changes are taking place in moving transport away from dirty diesels to clean, non-polluting electric vehicles, as well as looking into how London's electricity is generated. Does it still come from coal or is it generated from sustainable means? Electric vehicle explosion, and I don't mean the batteries. Almost one in five new cars sold in the UK are fully electric. This is resulting in less localised emissions as there are no toxic fumes from exhausts. 
Electric cars also use regenerative braking, which means you practically never use the brakes, or indeed cause those brake pads to create that fine particulate matter, PM2.5. More excited news on PM2.5 later! London has been actively expanding its EV charging infrastructure to support the growing number of electric vehicles. This includes installing public charging stations in various locations, such as streets, lampposts, car parks and public facilities, to encourage EV adoption. A brief look at ZapMap in London will highlight the already ridiculous number of charging stations across the capital. London has been exploring the concept of creating zero emission zones where only electric vehicles or vehicles with zero tailpipe emissions are allowed to operate. London introduced the ULEZ to restrict high polluting vehicles from entering certain areas in the city. This measure aimed to reduce air pollution and encourage the use of electric and low emission vehicles. It's worth pointing out that after I did a bit of research, I found out that this only applies to heavily polluting or very old cars. Most petrol cars under 16 years old or diesels under 6 years already meet the emission standard, so it's not quite as draconian as you might think. It's possibly more aimed at this. Surely any thinking person would say fair enough. Who wants to breed that? Lorries, vans and specialist heavy vehicles, all over 3.5 tonnes, and minibuses, buses, coaches, all over 5 tonnes, do not need to pay the ULEZ charge. As of August, all London boroughs will charge high-polluting cars £12.50 a day to enter these areas. Is this fair? Do you think people have the right to live in and breathe clean air? If not this, how else to incentivise people to ditch their highly polluting vehicles? Well, a decent scrappage scheme would be nice, wouldn't it? Oh, turns out they already have one. Eligible applicants can get up to £2,000 for scrapping a car or up to £1,000 for scrapping a motorbike. For wheelchair access vehicles, there is a payment of £5,000 to scrap or retrofit to the ULED standard. OK, this does seem quite helpful then. But maybe bring back government grants to help people afford their first electric car. If you were in charge of London, what would you do? Let me know in the comments below. Electric buses. Oh. Yeah, why not? Electric buses. Electric buses. The city has been gradually replacing its traditional diesel-powered buses with electric ones. This drastically helps reduce emissions and noise pollution on the streets. There are currently 950 pure electric buses operating in London. That's over 10% of all buses, single and double-deckers. Not a bad start. For a bit of context though, guess how many electric buses are in China? Go on, guess. Think of a number. Oh, I can't hear you. 421. Thousand! I guess there's some benefits to living under a dictatorship because, wow, you can really get things done if you want to. Backed by the Chinese group Geely, LEVC, or the London Electric Vehicle Company, now have over 6,500 electric black cabs in London's taxi fleet. Great, you might think, but then I found out that these are technically hybrids with a 1.5 litre petrol engine that kicks in as a range extender to charge up the batteries and achieves a real world range of around 50 miles on pure electric. Better than a diesel, I suppose, but I did think that these were fully electric originally, and I'd assume most other folks would too. Perhaps I'll dive a bit deeper into these and make a little video on it. Other fully electric taxis are available though, of which I saw plenty on my recent trip. Take Addison Lee for example, London's largest taxi firm who is aiming for 4,000 electric cars in its fleet by 2023, which is right now then. And it seems they took Sandy Munro's advice on which EV would make the best taxi, as they opted for Volkswagen's ID4s. A perfect EV! if you're a passenger. As Addison Lee puts it, 20,000 zero emission journeys each day in London. Things are moving in the right direction then. All of these EVs will make a massive dent in the UK's capital's emissions. And with every new EV on London's roads, it replaces an internal combustion engine and all the localised pollution that comes with it. The government and local authorities have been offering incentives and benefits to encourage the adoption of electric vehicles. These include tax incentives, with zero emissions vehicles being exempt of road tax, and exemptions from congestion charges. London has been working on improving cycling and pedestrian infrastructure to reduce reliance on cars and promote sustainable transport options. If you want to travel around totally carbon-free, a bicycle might also be the quickest way around any city. If of course you don't mind dicing with death from other road users and sucking on the fumes still coming up from the current majority of petrol and diesel engines. It would be lovely if all cities were as geared up for cycling as Denmark and Amsterdam, but I guess things are improving and are way better now for cyclists than they were in the past. It should go without saying that the most carbon neutral, cleanest, less impact way to travel around any city of the world would be to use your feet, a bicycle or public transport. Whether you can rely on or afford public transport is another matter. For example, it would cost me approximately £5 worth of electricity to drive to London and back in my electric car. That's an almost 200 mile round trip 
Perhaps parking would cost me a tenner, so £15 in total. Yet for our family to take the train at a time that suits us, it's a whopping £219. And then we don't know if strikes are going to take effect, or perhaps a group of protesters decide to stand in front of our high-speed train and make a high-speed human pizza. Given the choice, I'd sooner drive. However, I have a train-obsessed son, who gets as much pleasure from being on a train as this guy. London has apparently been focused on increasing its use of clean and renewable energy sources to reduce its carbon footprint. Here on electricityproduction.uk, we can see that today, on a very typical rainy British summer's day, 22% of all electricity is currently coming from gas, a reasonably healthy 25% is coming from wind, 7.6% from solar, and 5% nuclear, and 0% coal. If you are wondering what Interconnect is, Interconnect allows the trading and sharing of surplus electricity from other countries, and in this case right now, 38% of London's energy is coming from France, which is most likely nuclear. France invested heavily into this a long time ago and are now reaping the benefits and selling their excess energy to us. That would have been a great idea to invest in a long time ago, wouldn't it, people of Britain? Renewables' share of total electricity generation reached a record 47.8% in Q1 2023. That's not bad, is it? Almost half of the UK's energy required coming from the majority of wind power. In my basic brain, double the wind farms, invest heavily in battery storage like this one in Cottingham, and Bob's your uncle, 100% renewable energy most of the time. Oh, it seems so simple. I'm sure I'm missing something. Let me know. Electric planes. <sighs> Don't be daft, you can't power aeroplanes with batteries. Wrong! Here is the Velis Electro, which I know is real because I've seen it myself at Fully Charged Live. Just here, look. I actually touched it, but don't tell anyone, you're not supposed to. You too can book a flight on this superb, futuristic, flying milk float and take a trip over London. All emissions free, of course. And if you want to delve further into electric planes of the world, there are many. Google away and you'll find them. And I wonder just how long it will be before Tesla gives us a sneak peek at its VTOL, which is vertical takeoff and landing, aviation plans. Mark my words, it will happen. There's a lot more choice than I expected when delving into the world of electric motorbikes, mopeds and scooters and other e-mobility options. Having test ridden a few, they are so much fun to ride, silent and easy to operate and extremely cheap to charge up. If I lived in London or any city, I'd be all over one of these. Built in 1863, the London Underground is the world's oldest underground system and originally used steam trains before moving to electric ones in 1890. If you've had the pleasure of travelling on some of these noisy, rickety old trains, you may have noticed how polluted the air is down in the tunnels. If it's not from train engines due to them being electric, where does it come from? Well, the majority of air pollution in tunnels comes from brake dust, which creates and continually throws around tiny, iron-rich particles. Fine particulate matter is defined as particles that are 2.5 microns or less in diameter, and is more commonly referred to as PM2.5. To understand just how small these particulates are, here's an image of a human hair, and next to it, particles that are 10 microns, which is the size of dust, pollen and mould, and then there's PM2.5, which comes from the combustion of gas, oil, diesel or wood, from sources such as cars, trucks, buses, factories, construction sites, and of course, in the underground's case, PM2.5 comes from the brake dust of the tube trains. This then gets blown around in the air and continually added to year after year, Blow your nose after visiting the London Underground, and no doubt you'll catch some lovely PM 2.5 brake dust yourself. What a lovely souvenir. The reason it's so bad for us humans is that PM 2.5 particles are invisible to the naked eye. Unless there's so much of it you can see it in the haze, which often you can, and it's small enough to pass through the lungs, into your bloodstream, and into your organs. Almost 6% of adult deaths are linked by PM 2.5 each year. Electric trains regenerative braking is relatively standard on new trains, which limits wastefully burning through and creating loads of brake dust when braking. Progress! Despite many countries having zero electrified railways, the UK has managed to make 38% of its network electrified. China has over 70%, but India takes the top spot by having almost 80% of its railway network electrified. That's quite impressive, isn't it? For various reasons, I thought that India wasn't prepared for the uptake of electric vehicles, but if their railway network functions on stable electricity, so too could their cars. Tesla has recently been in discussions with India regarding building a gigafactory there, which might well produce Tesla's next generation $25,000 car. Might this be a suitable vehicle for India, as well as another export hub for cheap Teslas? Tell me what you think in the comments below. 
Whichever way you look at it, there is no benefit to using things that we know cause pollution and harm humans, especially when there are cleaner alternatives available. We'd all obviously be better off with cleaner air and an energy system that instead of burning stuff comes from renewables that creates clean, sustainable electricity and powers transport using batteries. More and more people are now understanding that the missing piece in the sustainable energy jigsaw is batteries, as they can store the electricity from renewables for use later on when the sun goes down or the wind takes a break. The UK should be heavily investing in mining for battery materials and producing as many as possible. As for the phony outrage of mining for battery materials, well, put simply, mining metals that can be recycled and reused indefinitely is not the same as mining coal to burn it only once. I'm more than happy to look at both sides of any argument. However, I'm not going to become so open-minded that my brain plops out, or so close-minded and arrogant to think that I already know everything and start screaming at people to take action. Perhaps I'm similar to the vast majority of people who are simply unsure whose facts to follow. The only thing I know for sure is my own experience of owning an electric car for four years, which has been ludicrously cheap to run and emitted zero pollution. I also recognise it's a good idea to create my own electricity at home with solar panels and battery storage, which I plan to do as soon as possible. I know that it makes a lot of sense for the world to get off fossil fuels and finally move us into the future with clean renewable energy. If the UK wants to be a leading nation in terms of decarbonisation, then we need to decarbonise all aspects of our economy. Clearly there is a long way to go, but with one in five cars sold being purely electric, almost 50% of our energy coming from renewables, and generally more awareness of all things electric, I do think the tide is turning and people are waking up to the benefits of a sustainable electric world. As always, I'd love to hear what you think of my ramblings. Do remember, I'm just trying to figure stuff out myself. What did I get right or wrong, in your opinion? I'm Will, this is the Tesla Jigsaw. Thanks so much for watching. And I make quite a lot of these YouTube videos now. Do check out my channel at Tesla Jigsaw, and I'll see you on the next one.